Okay, so now we get to the real business of Luther's development as a theologian and talk about his vocation as professor of theology and uh, the evidence we have for how he developed as a theologian up to the point of the 95 Theses in the fall of 1517. So as a professor of theology or a professor of Bible, uh, these were synonymous terms. Uh, Theology as a discipline was often just simply called sacred scripture in the Middle Ages. Luther uh, was uh, called to interpret the text of scripture, and as I mentioned, he, uh, like his mentor before him, von Staupitz, decided to give up other kinds of lectures like Lombard sentences, etc., and to devote himself entirely to lectures on the biblical text. Uh, although he did participate in other things like disputations or formal debates, uh, which were also part of the life of the medieval university. Uh, but as a professor of theology, Luther inherited a particular way of looking at the Bible and interpreting that text, uh, which is often called the medieval fourfold method of biblical study, uh, where any given text of scripture is looked at not only for its literal meaning or its historical meaning, which we, which Bible scholars often today look at, although for Luther that literal meaning was much more expansive than most scholars today viewed it because he believed it also had a prophetic meaning, that its literal sense could refer to things in the future, as conservative Christians continue to uh, view the literal sense today. Uh, but inherited from the early church fathers and practiced throughout the Middle Ages was a view that in addition to the literal sense of scripture, there was a threefold spiritual meaning of any given scriptural text. A tropological sense, an allegorical sense, and an anagogical sense. So uh, just, uh, I'll just give you a kind of a simple uh, example of this from the Psalms. The Psalms often talk about Jerusalem, right? Uh, and rejoice as the Jerusalem is the, the place of God. So the literal sense of Jerusalem in a psalm is obviously the, the physical place where David and Solomon uh, established first the tabernacle and then the temple. Um, uh, but prophetically, that literal place could refer to uh, something future regarding uh, Jerusalem. Uh, but in addition to that literal meaning, there was an ethical or tropological sense attached to the concept of Jerusalem in the Psalms. To go to Jerusalem meant to, to live a holy life worthy of God's presence, for example. Uh, or an allegorical sense. Uh, Jerusalem was held to be a figure or an allegory for the church. So that uh, Jerusalem in the Psalms uh, meant something for the church in the present day. Um, allegorically. And finally, an anagogical sense, that is uh, eschatological, looking toward the fulfillment of all things, what we call the end times, or the completion of all things. Uh, anagogically, uh, Jerusalem would prefigure heaven, uh, the new Jerusalem, as we often call it. So, what I'm getting at is Luther was <coughs> trained in and practiced this a rich way of looking at the Bible, uh, beyond its literal or historical or even its prophetic meaning to a whole several layers of spiritual meaning that were attached to the biblical text. As Luther lectured on the Bible, uh, he prepared uh, printed pages of the biblical text and had the local printer in Wittenberg, who was, I think, uh, uh, set up a shop right near the castle church, if I remember right, um, and hired that printer to prepare for himself uh, pages of the biblical text in the Latin Vulgate authoritative translation. Um, he had those texts uh, prepared with very wide letting, with the, the space between the lines and very wide margins, because his students would be given copies and he had a copy and, and they used those spaces to write marginal comments or interlinear comments on the text. And so as Luther prepared his lecture, he had a page full of those kinds of notes. And we also have evidence that he prepared something called a scolia, or summary, kind of a more narrative commentary of what he would have spoken in the lecture hall. Um, 
we have, uh, I think it's from the uh, earliest lectures or perhaps, yes, I think it's the earliest lectures on the Psalms, which I'll summarize <coughs> in a minute, that, we've, uh, that scholars have discovered some of the scholia where Luther's full comments are written out, in addition to some of the pages where Luther's handwritten uh, notes are given. So we have quite a clear idea in many cases of what Luther was saying in his lecture hall. Um, if we turn to the next uh, slide, we see uh, one of those pages that's preserved uh, from his later Rome lectures on the Epistle of St. Paul to the Romans. This is Luther's handwriting. This is the very wide uh, margins and the very wide uh, spaces between the lines uh, that Luther had prepared, again, for himself, but also for his students, uh, so that they could take down notes as he lectured on the biblical text. Again, the Latin text was the basis for his commentary. Um, we have a, a, a whole lot of evidence that shows that over the course of the years leading up to the early Reformation, Luther had four major sets of uh, lectures uh, that uh, took at least one, but often more than one or two or even four semesters to go through uh, a series of lectures. And the first uh, lectures that Luther gave were on the Psalms. Um, he started in October of 1513 and continued these lectures until 1515. And uh, these are known as the Dictata Super Psalterium, the uh, Dictations on the Psalter. And these were not published in Luther's day. Uh, and so they would not have been accessible to people in Luther's day. But modern scholars have discovered these in libraries, and they have been published since the late 19th century. And so modern scholars have looked at these for, for to investigated these texts to see how Luther was developing as a theologian long before the public was uh, presented with his theology in his early publications. And uh, one of the major, major themes of these first psalms on the uh, lectures on the psalms are that the psalms are about Christ and the church. And Luther, in a very traditional way, uh, interpreted the psalms as very much about the church and the experience of the Christian uh, in the church. And something new that we see in these psalms lectures is that while it was common to see the Psalms as prophetic of Christ, Luther saw Christ himself as uh, a model and an example of the Christian. So he interpreted the Psalms not only about Christ, but about the Christian in relation to what is spoken there. And uh, so they're very interesting to, to read these Psalms lectures and to see the rich spiritual content of the Psalms as Luther taught his uh, students to view them. Uh, then in 1515, Luther turned to lecture on the book of Romans. And uh, here we see the Christian living by humble faith at work in Luther's theology. Uh, these were also not published in Luther's day, um, uh, but only published in the early 20th century. So again, only modern scholarship has had an opportunity to see Luther developing as a theologian through these early lectures. A little different with Luther's lectures on Galatians, which he gave in 1515, or 1516 to 1517. These Luther prepared for publication several years later in 1519, as he was already embroiled in controversy over his 95 theses. Um, and uh, finally, in this uh, period, Luther turned to lecture on the Hebrews, the letter to the Hebrews, and one uh, historian describes the content of these lectures as a theology of testament, of promise. That Luther is, is starting to uh, really challenge some of the theological assumptions uh, that he had been trained in in these earlier uh, lectures. Now finally, um, uh, very much in the wake of the controversy on the 95 Theses, Luther turned to the Psalms again uh, late in 1518, but probably not beginning the formal lectures until 1519. And here in these lectures, which again were published um, at the time in installments, the first five uh, 
lectures were published in 1519 and sold out within the year. Uh, a second edition was, was prepared. Uh, here we can see that Luther was not only teaching his students a full new theology, what we call the Reformation theology of Martin Luther, uh, but he was making this publicly known as these lectures were being made available. Uh, to the academic world, at least. They were Latin and uh, uh, published in Latin. And um, Although it's quite possible. I may, maybe these were even translated. I, I need to review that. Well, let's look in a little more detail at uh, Luther's earliest lectures on the Psalms. Many scholars see that uh, a kind of an Augustinian theology of humility is at work here. Uh, and they look at the influence of Luther's uh, mentor, Johann von Staupitz, who published uh, also in the discipline of, of theology of piety and understanding of what it meant to be a humble sinner before God and what it meant to be truly penitent. And uh, uh, theologians uh, and historians look at these lectures and see here Luther quite traditional in many ways but also very influenced by certain movements of piety and theology that were active uh, in his circle. Um, and uh, we see a big emphasis on, on these lectures on the nature of sin in the human being, and the greatest sins are self-righteousness and self-sufficiency and pride. And so the real need of the sinner is, come to, is to come to a true contrition, a true sorrow for one's sin. And how then can the sinner be justified before God? Uh, Luther is very much working still in a, uh, an understanding that one must uh, confess properly and uh, totally accuse oneself and not have any sense of righteousness, uh, but rather condemn oneself and come before God in humble faith uh, in these lectures. Uh, to get the next slide gives us just an example. Commenting on the passage from Psalm 70 or Psalm 71 in, in our Bibles today, Psalm 70 is the number in the Latin the Vulgate translation. Commenting on the passage, and your righteousness, O God, even unto the highest, Luther writes, this, in this verse the correct distinction between divine and human righteousness is described at last. For the righteousness of God reaches up to the highest of heavens, and causes us to reach there. It is righteousness even to the highest, namely of reaching the highest. Human righteousness, however, is not so, but rather reaches down to the depths. And this is so because he who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. But now the entire righteousness of God is this, to humble oneself into the depth. The man who does this comes to the highest because he first went down into the lowest depth. And here the psalmist rightly refers to Christ, who is the power of God and the righteousness of God through the greatest and deepest humility. Therefore, he is now in the highest through supreme glory. Uh, one little line in the, in the Latin text of the Hebrew psalm that Luther richly uh, describes in terms not only of what it meant for Jesus but what it means for the Christian and what it means for the Christian to be truly contrite and humble before God. Uh, the next slide continues uh, with this but uh, I'm not going to read all that. Uh, you get the same flavor uh, coming out of this psalm uh, that uh, justification before God comes as one humbles oneself, condemns oneself, and uh, receives uh, God's judgment. Uh, and uh, through that judgment, uh, God makes one righteous. And the next slide also, yeah, okay. And now we'll build upon this a little more. As we look not only at these uh, lectures on the Psalms, but on Luther's uh, lectures on Romans, we can say that Luther is uh, traditional in many ways. Uh, but he is also emphasizing certain things that correspond to some developments of late medieval theology. Uh, one of those is a concept of the theology of the cross, making Christ's suffering 
uh, the center of Christian piety and devotion. Uh, seeing Christ as a great example of what it means to humble oneself. Um, seeing that uh, God is at work in the Christian and that as God is at work, God makes demands, uh, but also God gives uh, through his work uh, uh, an activity of grace to change the life of the Christian. Uh, God's alien work is to kill, to drive out the old Adam, to put to death. Uh, but God is also at work um, giving, uh, giving life, and he does so specifically through suffering. Um, in many ways, then, therefore, Luther's uh, theology is uh, traditional, but begins to um, take a certain emphasis that we can see in people like Staupitz, his mentor. Um, well, uh, in this slide we uh, kind of summarize some of the ways that Luther's theological training uh, was at work here. Uh, remember, he was trained in scholastic nominalism. Uh, that is that um, God is at work in Christ and through grace. Um, and in the nominalist tradition, the center of God's gracious work is this concept of covenant or making a pact, a pactum or a covenant with the human being. And in this understanding, uh, the human being has to do his or her part in the work of salvation, cooperating, as it were, with God's grace to achieve salvation. In Gabriel Beale, one of the most influential late uh, medieval theologians in Germany, uh, and Luther had studied Gabriel Beale's commentaries on uh, the Mass, for example, uh, Luther read of how a human being can purely by natural ability do uh, works that are partially meritorious, partially good before God. And God's grace is, uh, and the promise of God in the covenant made in baptism is that God will take that partial goodness that the human being can achieve and perfect it, as it were, so that the human being can do worthy merits, what were called merito condigno, uh, merits with dignity, we could translate that quite literally. And uh, in this pactum or covenant theology, what we really see at work is that God's grace meets a person who does their best and promises to help them toward achieving salvation. Um, easy way to remember it is the phrase, do your best and God will do the rest. And that's a very loose translation of a, of a Latin phrase that we, quite, that we see in these, uh, these texts of late medieval theology. To do what is in you. Or to, do, to those who do what is in themselves, God will not deny his grace to lead them to salvation. As Luther turned to the letter of Romans then, he really saw a confirmation of, of God's justifying of sinners through this kind of gracious activity that still is working with the human being in some respect. Uh, and uh, God's real goal in, uh, in the uh, life of the person is to break down and to uproot any self-righteousness and to lead the person to true um, contrition, sorrow for sin, true repentance and turning to God. And that as God does this, God brings about the righteousness of the sinner and therefore justifies the sinner. Um, theologians have gone back and forth, uh, and historians too, as to how much of Luther's mature understanding of justification by faith alone is at work in these early lectures. And there's evidence that something's going on in Luther's uh, development. He can be quite critical of churchly traditions of his time. In the Romans lectures, he refers to scholastic theologians at one point as O sau theologen, O pig theologians, uh, bitingly critical of some of the traditions he had learned that he thought were leading people to self-righteousness. And here we've seen that Luther views the Psalms and Romans as God at work um, bringing the sinner to total humility 
and not to self-righteousness at all. Uh, and yet, there's still a kind of works going on in, in some of this uh, language at least, because uh, the human being is still active, as it were, in uh, responding uh, to God's activity uh, through his life. Um, I'll just very briefly then uh, try to characterize how we can see influences at work in Luther's theology as uh, these years lead him toward the 95 Theses and the developments of the early uh, or the late 15 teens that really make him into Luther the Reformer. Um, and so I, I'm summarizing these, and this, these are very nicely laid out for you also in uh, this short book that I've recommended on the paper I handed out and is uploaded as well in the, on the, uh, what do you call this, the Adobe, the Adobe work. A um, uh, little book by Scott Hendricks simply called Luther, but in the Abingdon Pillars of Theology series that traces Luther's theo theological development very concisely. And he lays out six major influences in Luther's theology that I think will help us to understand all of the dynamics that were at work in Luther developing into the reformer that he became. We've talked already quite a bit about monasticism tonight. Let's go to the next slide. Um, uh, but again, to emphasize that Luther's whole theological development was made up in the monastery as well as in the university. And the uh, study of St. Augustine was very important for him, the traditions of the Augustinian order, and the traditions especially of understanding uh, Christian experience and uh, understanding that reading the Bible means to interpret that experience uh, at work uh, are very much active in, in his development as a theologian. Uh, next, we uh, see that Luther's engagement with Holy Scripture is uh, deeply influential in his development. His vocation was to preach the scripture text in the church, uh, to lecture on the scriptural text daily in the university, in the monastery. He was constantly hearing, reading uh, uh, scripture. And uh, very important uh, in this develop development for Luther is his understanding as a monastic figure uh, that scripture is God at work, as it were, in the life of the friar, or the monk, or the individual Christian. Uh, and again, that scripture is actually, as we read it, as we hear it read to us, is actually at work interpreting our experience of life in relationship to God. And I think uh, we see this at work in, in Luther's early and late lectures. As uh, Luther <coughs> is engaged in these lectures as I've summarized them in these early years. We definitely see that something, something is happening to this young man. He's clearly a very gifted theologian. Uh, he develops a following of people that are very interested. He begins publishing some of his works in popular forms already in 1517. His first published work is a German commentary on the seven penitential psalms, as they were known that he writes not for the academic audience of his students or the monastery, but for the public at large. And so as Luther is not only engaging the Bible as a scholar, he's also seeking to communicate that to ordinary Christians in his day. Uh, these early lectures also show that Luther is a very creative theologian. While totally loyal to the Roman church of his day, he can be quite critical of the church. And even in the very earliest Psalms lectures, he will uh, talk about those Psalms that are talking about Jerusalem or the church or Christ in ways that, in his view, uh, exposes some of the hypocrisy and corruptions of the church of his day. Uh, and so uh, Luther is clearly fulfilling his role as a theologian called by and loyal to the Catholic church uh, but also is willing to be quite critical uh, of that church. 
A uh, third is scholasticism, and again, in particular, this nominalist tradition of scholasticism, also known as the Via Moderna. Um, from in his early uh, years in the monastery, Luther studied carefully uh, Gabriel Beale's commentary on the canon of the Mass, and this is where he learned that covenant or pactum theology that uh, really saw God at work in the baptized believer to bring their works uh, to some merit uh, by God's grace. In 1509, he lectured on Lombard sentences, and so is, again, at a very high level engaged in this tradition of, uh, of nominalist scholasticism. And in this particular kind of scholasticism, I think we can see three important influences at work. Uh, first of all, the importance of God's words. <coughs> you may or may not remember from last week, but I talked about the uh, difference between nominalism and realism, both in philosophy and theology. That in Thomist realism, at the back of all things is the mind of God and the ideas or universals that God creates. And you're a human being because you participate in those universals that, that God has in his mind. Um, nominalism doubts the reality of universals. Rather, God brings individual things into existence by the power of his word. And so the reality of something uh, depends on God naming that something into existence. And um, I think in not only in Luther's attention to scripture as an authority, but his view that scripture is powerful as scripture is preached or read or heard uh, to bring about uh, life and to actually do this work that we've summarized, uh, to do the work, uh, the alien work of killing or humbling the sinner and to do the proper work of raising to life uh, a justified sinner uh, in right relationship with God. A second, in nominalism, Luther learned to distinguish sharply between philosophy and theology, between what reason can accomplish and what one must believe by faith through the revelation of God's word. Uh, in this tradition, uh, this was understood uh, through logic and a very disciplined and rigorous dialectical method, we call it, uh, uh, the disputation method of uh, coming to truth by making propositions and defending those theses uh, is very much at work. And next week when we talk about the 95 theses and several other disputations that, were, uh, that Luther was involved in very early or even before the Reformation movement, we'll see how Luther was, though he became critical of Aristotle and the influence of that philosopher on scholasticism, he was himself uh, richly trained in the logic and analysis that came through this tradition. And uh, always employed it in his life, even though he could also criticize the overestimation of reason and the use of reason, especially in theology. Uh, finally, the last influence of nominalism would be a negative one that Luther struggled with and eventually came to reject. The view of nominalist scholasticism, that every human being has potential, can at least do partially good works that are meritorious before God, and is free to choose to love God and to serve God, and uh, has therefore God's promise. If you do your part, God will meet you with his grace. Um, Luther will uh, struggle with that, and I think we see that at work in these early lectures. Uh, and finally, he will come to reject it, and that's at the basis, finally, of his belief in justification by faith alone, not by faith and works, or by works. Uh, Scott Hendricks gives us a rather uh, concise definition of how the Occamist tradition viewed um, salvation, what we call soteriology, the way human beings are saved. And uh, I'd like to read that briefly. Um, it just gives us kind of a grounding for this rich tradition in which Luther was trained. 
Uh, nominalist soteriology is a system based on the idea of covenant as the central principle in theology, in opposition to Thomas, or Thomistic realism, who viewed the center of theology as grace perfecting nature, by which God is obligated to accept the human, that is, in order to complete or perfect his own creation. Nominalists, that is, people like William of Ockham, Gabriel Beale, oppose the idea that God could be under any kind of obligation. They countered that God accepts the human being not on the basis of man's perfection under grace, but on the basis of God's own freely made decision that he will accept the efforts of those who do what is in them because he is faithful to his covenant with man. So you see this idea, if you do your part, God will meet you with his grace because he's promised it, not because God needs to do something uh, in relation to his creatures. Um, if we look at the next slide, we kind of get a graph of how this covenant was working in the theology in which Luther was trained. The human being since the fall of Adam is sinful, uh, but the natural man still has the ability freely to choose to do good. And uh, those uh, good works that one does are not perfect. Uh, they are uh, hardly perfect, but to those who do them, God will not deny his grace. And so God meets that sinner who has some capacity. We call it free will, or they called it free will. Uh, God meets that person with his grace. That begins in holy baptism and the conversion of the sinner. And then because of God's grace, that human being who can only partially do good uh, is enabled to do worthy merits, which in the end achieve salvation. Um, this is the idea of covenant in which you see that good works have a critical role to play, even though it's still a salvation by God's grace working in the human being as long as you do your best. The next uh, big influence in Luther's development is the, the Augustin, or Augustinian tradition. Uh, Luther loved Augustine's works, uh, but more important was that Augustine's <coughs> theology was influential throughout the Middle Ages. And Luther uh, would claim Augustine as a very important figure, even though he became what we might call a critical <coughs> user of Augustine as uh, he engaged the theology of his time. Um, I won't read this, but uh, Luther could appeal to Augustine, for example, when in the middle of the dispute about indulgences, and he's being accused of being a heretic quite early on, he can, appoint, he can point to how Augustine also said that only scripture in the final analysis is uh, without error and totally reliable. And um, um, that's a very important for his developing principle of sola scriptura, or the authority of scripture alone as the highest authority. Um, this Augustinian tradition was very rich throughout the Middle Ages. It was very definitive for Luther's mentor, uh, Johann von Staupitz. Uh, but uh, Luther, again, uh, uses this as a critical uh, means of uh, engaging in theology. And lots of things are going on as the Reformation begins to take shape, as we'll see, uh, in the late 15-teens or actually the pre-Reformation, I think we should call it. Um, and one of those things was that this humanist appeal to go back to the sources, and one of those most important sources for Luther being Augustine was at work as uh, Luther, among others, in Wittenberg was uh, shaping uh, the teaching of the university there. We see an example of this when Luther writes to his brother Augustinian, Johannes Lang, in 1517. He says, our theology in Augustine advance with good fortune and reign in our university through God's doing. Aristotle descends gradually, properly headed for eternal ruin in the future. <laughs> the lectures of the sentence commentators are wondrously disdained, nor can anyone hope for auditors unless they want to teach this theology, namely from the Bible or Augustine or some other teacher of ecclesiastical life. 
story. So uh, there's really, uh, in a very organized way, and not Luther alone, but Luther is a member of a, of a faculty. Colleagues at work are busy changing the way theology is being taught at the University of Wittenberg in these years when Luther is a professor there. In 1518, a young genius or prodigy by the name of Philip Melanchthon is uh, called to university to teach Greek and philosophy. Uh, he'll later also do the baccalaureate of, of Bible degree and, and, and do some lectures on the New Testament. Um, by 1521, so uh, again, on the very cusp of the beginning Reformation movement, scholastic theology is no longer operative at the University of Wittenberg. Uh, rather, the focus is on the Bible and the literature of the early church fathers and Philip Melanchthon's own new method of theological study called the Loki method, where topics of theology are engaged and specifically drawn from the epistle of Paul to the Romans, which really gave shape to, way, to the way uh, the Reformation began to teach and practice the theological discipline. Uh, another uh, emphasis I'll just mention briefly are some traditions of humanism that are at work in Luther's early theology especially. Uh, this emphasis on personal resignation and humility before God is uh, clearly uh, a theme in Luther, but it also is a tradition from mystical theology of the Middle Ages. Um, God's hiddenness is emphasized, uh, what is sometimes called negative theology or apophatic theology, that we don't focus on what God does but on what is hidden in God. And, and uh, uh, these things are at work, and Luther even publishes a, uh, a book um, called The German Theology that he uh, finds some affinity with in 1518, I think he publishes that. Um, there's rich themes that are at work in Luther's theology, in other words, from this tradition. Uh, next, we look at humanism again. Um, uh, and I've talked about this quite a bit, so only in summary, Luther was totally devoted to this new movement to study scripture in the original languages. Though he always used the Latin text as the basis uh, for his lectures, uh, he begins very uh, often to refer to the Greek text of the New Testament, to the Hebrew text of the Old Testament, as he is engaging his students with the study of the Bible. And uh, Luther was very active, along with his colleagues, in promoting a humanist-oriented curricular reform at the university in Wittenberg. With that, I want to close today with uh, just uh, one last uh, slide to introduce something I'd like you to do in the meantime, between now and next week, if possible. Uh, and that is to take a look at, as we look at Luther becoming a reformer beginning next week, how Luther, late in his life, uh, looked at this development. If you can get a hold of a copy of uh, John Dillenberger's uh, uh, selected works of Martin Luther, it's in there. It's also in Luther's works, and I've put these uh, several of these texts on the back of the sheet I handed out today. Um, but I'll, I'll begin the, the talk next week by talking briefly about the way Luther, in retrospect, about a year before he died, looked back at his theological development, and specifically his discovery or rediscovery of justification by faith. Um, and uh, you might consider some of these questions if you get a chance to, to have a look at that text. The other thing I'd like you to have a look at next week as we, as we begin to look at Luther engaging as a reformer are the 95 Theses, also in Dillenberger or volume 31 of Luther's works. There's also, if you happen to have access to one, a new edition heavily annotated of Luther's work, six volumes like this, published by uh, Fortress Press, called The Annotated Luther. And in the first volume, The Roots of Reform, we have several of the texts that I'm going to be talking about next week. The Heidelberg Disputation, as, long, as well as the 95 Theses. Again, if you get a chance to have a look at uh, these, whether you're here in class or far away, 
uh, it will be helpful for our presentation next week. And the last thing is a, um, a translation that I've developed. It's still a little rough, but um, uh, one of Luther's early bestsellers. Uh, you'll find if you get a chance to read them, the 95 Theses are very difficult, obtuse, disputation writing. And I don't expect you to understand much of them, although we'll, we'll draw out of them what we can to understand why they provoked the Luther matter, of the, of the uh, charges of heresy, etc., that propelled him into becoming Luther the Reformer. But more important was how Luther communicated these basic ideas about indulgences to the general public. Uh, already in March of 1518, Luther published a sermon on indulgence and grace. And I'll pass out these, and for those afar, I've, we've uploaded uh, my translation of these. Uh, this, I think, you'll find much more ac uh, accessible. And so we'll spend some time uh, looking at how Luther engaged the piety of his day in terms of indulgences uh, early in the session uh, next week. So. Are there any questions as in the last five minutes or so we have? Can we start passing those around? Or from afar? <laughs> Not yet. Yes? I was wondering if you could comment on uh, Luther's grasp of nominalism versus Plato's idealism, because that seemed to come into conflict um, later on in the uh, continental thought, was the ideals of Plato versus was just getting rid of the universals and nominalism. So I was just wondering if you could comment on uh, if what, what Luther might have thought of Plato versus Occam. Yeah, that's a good question. The first thing that we need to, uh, to realize is that all this is mediated through a long tradition of scholastic theology. So Plato is not much at all in view, but rather the Thomist tradition uh, that goes back first to Neoplatonism and then originally back eventually back to Plato. But what you're getting at is this the existence of these universals and the relationship then between the human being and God as creator. Right? And uh, I guess I would be prepared only to say a few things about that. Um, um, I think Luther was a nominalist in the sense that, that he was operating in this view that, that universals don't really exist, but what God creates by his word is what we deal with and what really exists. Um, some would blame Luther, therefore, for condemning Th Thomas in the Thomist tradition without really understanding it fully, because Luther's trained in this nominalist tradition. Um, but it's difficult to say. I mean, Luther engaged uh, committed Thomists during the Reformation. His first examiner uh, publicly um, from the Roman Church, Cardinal Cayetan, was an expert Thomist philosopher and theologian. And uh, I, I think uh, they understood each other pretty well, uh, even though they, um, they could not come to any agreement. So. Um, yeah, it's a difficult question. I hope I helped you a little bit with it. But, uh, yeah, I didn't expect like, a yeah. big grand answer. The, 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 the big thing is that all of this, whether it's Plato or Aristotle, it's all filtered through this whole long tradition. We can say commentary tradition. And Luther's reaching it through these means. Right? Luther probably never read anything by Occam. But rather, this Gabriel Beale, who was active at the University of Tübingen, where Philip Melanchthon had been a student, and, and uh, Luther had his text, this commentary on the canon of the Mass. It's all filtered through these kinds of things. Yeah. yeah. I appreciate hearing these different influences on Luther, like the, the six different things. Yeah. Um, in the movies that you see about Luther, though, you, you see uh, his trip to Rome was very 
important uh, as far as his development and, and rejection of the, the, you know, the practices that were going on. You didn't mention much about that. Yeah. I, do you feel that was uh, quite influential for Luther? I, I think certainly when we see the kinds of criticism Luther can make of the church, for example, in his earliest Psalms commentaries, you probably see some result of Luther's, we can say, disappointment. As he goes to Rome as a pilgrim, as his mission is unsuccessful, but mostly as he's confronted by what he later describes as, as the cavalier treatment of, uh, of, of priests, uh, uh, Heinz uh, Schilling in his biography I noticed just last week as I was reading these early chapters says that everything we know about Luther's trip to Rome is from much later reflections by Luther and so that kind of filters everything so he doesn't put a lot of stake in, in what Luther says negatively about that experience in Rome um, and I think there's, a, there's something to be said about that Luther is describing these things long after he has really rejected what Rome represents. Um, but I think if we see Luther critical of his church, even by, while being very loyal to his church in his earliest lectures, I think we may uh, put some, some validity into, this, into these statements Luther makes that he was shocked with the kind of corruption and, and uh, especially cavalierness that he saw among priests, etc. And we have the same issue with Luther's 1545 preface. Here Luther, again, 25 years later, reflecting on events in quite detail. And I think the evidence is he remembers things very, very well. Uh, but when you remember things of a very long time ago, <coughs> you always filter those things you're remembering through later experience. Yeah. Whether it's you know when you first met your wife or you know, you know and and uh, think about that as you read Luther's recounting of these events, because Luther is recounting them at a very different time, and we'll try to get at that when we look at that text. Next week. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Sincerely, we're thankful for um, Dr. Maxfield and his presentation tonight. Um, we're thankful for our second year students next year to be a vicar, we hope. Um, Josh, who's running the technology and making sure that people at home can see that. Um, I want to say thanks to Ellen and to Nancy and to Denise. For, um, for those of you who aren't here, you have to find your own snacks in the fridge. But um, they help provide for us a, a wonderful evening break. Um, and I, I want to say thanks to each of you for being part of it, whether you're at home watching, it is a fulfillment of our mission to be able to um, not only um, share messages like this, but it's all part of what happens as an outcome, that we form servants for Jesus' sake. And Jesus Christ is the core for the forgiveness of sin for our life um, as a life of faith. I, I also want to say um, two other things. One is that um, we are, amazingly, it's the end of the second evening. We're just over halfway now, right? So we have two more sessions. I hope that you're able to join us again next week and the following week. Um, but I want to make another, a, a little plug, if I can, for um, All Saints Day, November 1st. For the whole region, we are having a, a Reformation Hymn Festival. It will be at All Saints Lutheran Church here in Edmonton. Um, we hope that all of you are able to be part of that and that um, bring friends. Um, we hope that it's a wonderful celebration of the message of Luther, the hymns and hymnody of Luther, and those hymns that Luther's theology inspired. Um, spread the word. We hope that that's a, a marvelous celebration in word and song. That's three weeks from tonight, November 1st, All Saints Lutheran here in Edmonton. And then just a final closing word before the prayer. Um, we talk about the Reformation as an, an historical event, and indeed it's a significant historical event that has shaped us and our church. But uh, for those of you who are part of Lutheran Church Canada, um, we go into um, a significant weekend this weekend when the National um, Lutheran Church Canada Convention unfolds on Friday in uh, Kitchener. 
And um, we trust that you are praying people who will continue to remember uh, the church and the church structure and all the things that are involved in that. Um, Christ is the Lord of the church. That's what Luther pre prepares um, as he's, as he's uh, sharing his message, but that's what he presents, and that's part of our heritage. And we trust that Christ, the Lord of his church, will not only be present, but will guide all the things that happen. But we appreciate um, your prayers for the church, as well as those that continue to be an ongoing part of our our ministry as a seminary of the church, um, your prayers, your support, sending good students to us, um, that's all part of fulfilling our mission. Uh, let's have a closing word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for all the blessings that you give, again, for reminding us of the journey of Luther's um, theology, theological development and experience that um, we can study and um, that can help us better understand who he is and um, what his theology means, not only for its day, but also for us. Again, we pray that you would um, remind us of the treasure that we have in the gospel of Jesus Christ, the forgiveness of sin, and the assurance of life everlasting by grace through faith. We pray that you would give us a quiet evening's rest tonight and awaken us tomorrow refreshed, willing, and eager to serve you as we live out our life of faith. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. Safe travels home. God bless. Here are a few extra copies of the handout um, for tonight. If you didn't grab one.